Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги! Мы начинаем наш вебинар. Меня зовут Светлана Делевская, аналитическое экологическое агентство Green Women. Я хочу ознакомить вас с правилами вебинара. Вы видите с правой стороны чат, где вы можете задавать свои вопросы. Наш спикер будет говорить на английском языке. Мы будем осуществлять перевод с русского на английский и с английского на русский. Презентация для удобства уже переведена на русский язык. По окончании вебинара эксперт ответит на ваши вопросы. А сейчас Лидия Останина, директор Green Women, расскажет немного о вебинаре и представит нашего спикера. Добрый день, уважаемые участники. Мы надеемся на плодотворную работу на нашем втором вебинаре по нанотеме. Сегодня с нами снова Дэвид Азулей. Нередко реализация важной инициативы зависит от энтузиастов. Дэвид именно такой энтузиаст. Он создал группу IPEN по нанотехнологиям. IPEN многие знают и являются членами этой большой сети неправительственных организаций, работающих над проектами для будущего без токсичных веществ на пяти континентах. Дэвид – французский адвокат, работает в неправительственной организации – в Центре международного экологического права, офисы которой находятся в США и Швейцарии. Над вопросами регулирования НАНО Дэвид работает уже более 10 лет на европейском и на глобальном уровне. Тема презентации Дэвида о роли гражданского общества, как создавать сети НПО для деятельности в сфере нанотехнологий следует принципу предосторожности. Пожалуйста, Дэвид. Дэвид, и сейчас вы можете начинать свою презентацию. Well, thank you very much to both and uh, to both Lydia's and um, hello uh, to all the participants. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, what are nanotechnologies and what is the role of NGOs in ensuring uh, a better governance for those, uh, for those aspects. Uh, next slide. So here is uh, what I'm going to talk to you about now. This is the, the plan. I'm going to give you a little primer about what Nano is. And I'm going to discuss a little who we are at CL and I10 uh, and discuss the various objective and strategies that NGOs have put in place, uh, look at historically how the uh, NGOs have engaged on those issues. Then we're going to look also possibly at the way forward and what can be done uh, by everyone. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what is nanotechnology? Nanotechnology is the study of the controlling of matter and an atomic and molecular scale. We're talking extremely, extremely small uh, uh, pieces. Uh, yeah, next slides, please. Um, so to give you an idea, we usually talk about nanotechnologies uh, at between one and 100 nanometer. Now this is so small that it is hard to realize what we're talking about. So to give you an idea, a human hair, uh, one like mine, is 80,000 nanometer wide. A red blood cell that we have in our uh, in our veins, running through our vein to transport oxygen, is about 2,000 nanometer wide, while a DNA strand is about 200 nanometers. So we're talking about particles that are somewhere between the size of a DNA strand and at least one order of magnitude smaller than a red blood cell. Very, very small stuff. And why is that relevant? Uh, next slide, please. It's relevant because when we go, when you go at the, oh, I think I'm speaking too fast. Um, I'm going to wait for the presentation to come back up. Lydia's, uh, can we put the presentation back on, please? Uh, just one, uh, one moment, David, <laughs> just a second.
Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes, we're back online. Thank you very much. Uh, and sorry, maybe I went a little too fast to start. So what I was saying is, why is it relevant? And what changes uh, at the nanoscale is that when you go at the, the, the very small scale, when you reduce the size of a particle, you have a much higher surface area to volume ratio so you keep the same volume of product but the surface area uh, as you can see in the uh, in in the picture here with the with the little cubes gets much bigger uh, gets much larger and when that happens uh, you have different quantum effects optical effects physical effects or chemical effects, different chemicals effect, and much more that we're still trying, starting to understand. And I'm gonna give you now a few examples so you know uh, more in more practical details what I'm talking about. Uh, next slide, please. So we can take the example of gold. Uh, everybody knows gold. It's yellow, mostly inert chemically, and it's a very poor uh, electricity and heat conductor. And it's very stable chemically, meaning that if you add it to a chemical reaction, the chemical reaction will happen and, the, um, and gold will come out at the end. You will have the product of the chemical reaction on one side and gold will come out and will not have interacted with the other products. If you cut it down, or if you produce gold in very small particles uh, of about 30 nanometers, it becomes red. It, it is still a poor electricity conductor, but it's starting to be an okay heat conductor, and it becomes mildly reactive. If you shrink it further to three nanometers, it becomes bright green. It becomes an excellent conductor of heat, excellent conductor of electricity and very um, uh, reactive chemically. It will, uh, it will be very reactive. So as you can see, we still have the same chemical element, gold, but its properties are completely different. Uh, next slide, please. The other example uh, that we can use is carbon. We're all very familiar with carbon. It's what uh, exists at the end of the pencils or also what you find in coal, which is mostly pure carbon. Now, if you take carbon atoms and you manufacture tubes, as you can see on the, on the slide here, of just a few nanometers wide, so roughly the same width as a, a DNA strand, for example, you get a material that is uh, both, oops, yeah, that is both uh, ten times uh, stronger than steel, and ten times lighter than steel. So as you can imagine, there is a lot of uh, possible, and it also has all sorts of optical um, or magnetic properties. So it is a very interesting. Uh, material a lot with which you can do a lot of different things but and there is a but uh, next slide please as the chemical properties and sometimes optical or magnetic properties of the material changes the um, toxicological uh, and ecotoxicological uh, properties also change uh, drastically uh, next slide. So there's still a lot of things that we know or don't know that we don't know about uh, nanomaterial toxicology, but here are a few things uh, that we know. Um, so as I mentioned, the toxicology of nanoparticles for both uh, human health and environment 
differs severely from the same material in the bulk form. Uh, for example, certain carbon nanotubes that I just mentioned, those tubes made out of uh, carbon atoms, if you inhale them, they will behave in your lung just like asbestos fiber, meaning that they will make you sick for a very long time and will eventually kill you uh, in very severe pain. We know that uh, certain nanoparticles have the ability to cross the brain blood barrier and placenta barrier, which are normally very protective barriers in our uh, human, in the human body. We know that some nanoparticle, because in part because they can cross the, plac the placenta, will be transmitted to the future generation. So the experiments that were made was a uh, mother mouse was exposed to nanoparticles, uh, titanium dioxide nanoparticles. And we could find uh, those same titanium dioxide nanoparticles in their offsprings, in their children, but also in their offsprings offspring. At the third generation, those nanoparticles were still being uh, passed on. We also know, for example, that silver nanoparticles that is very widely used for antibacterial properties, it is used in shirts, it is used in cosmetics and in uh, a lot of other products, we know that it affects um, young males' sperm quality uh, in a lot of animal models. We also know that some nanoparticles have shown severe toxicity to some fish species and some freshwater ecosystem. So as you can see, we know of a lot of possible impacts from nanoparticles, but it is still unclear what the toxicity mechanism is, or how do you identify some nanoparticles will have some impacts and some nanoparticles will be benign and will have almost no impacts on health and the environment. But what we don't know is how to distinguish those two. We don't know if it's a matter of size only or if it's also a matter of coding, of uh, uh, chemical identity uh, or others. Next slide, uh, please. So at this stage, we know just enough to be sure that there will be unwanted effects. But we don't know enough to evaluate or anticipate those effects very precisely. So in the current state of uncertainty, allowing these products on the market in a totally uncontrolled way is like uh, conducting uh, a large-scale experiment on the biosphere. And just so you know, there is no slide on this topic. So maybe Lydia, see if you think it needs to be translated. But uh, there are uh, thousands of products that contains nanomaterials today. From sports equipment, tennis rackets, uh, textiles, shirts, every um, anti-odor or antibacterial uh, shirt or socks that you buy usually contains nanomaterials. We find them in cosmetics. We find them in food, as food additives and colorants. We can find them in building materials, whether they are paints or uh, additives to concrete or other element to give them specific properties. We find them in military application. We find them in uh, consumers' uh, applications. and. It is currently impossible to know exactly how many products contain nanomaterials or which products contain nanomaterials because the regulation uh, is very weak and there is currently no obligations to, uh, to declare uh, nanomaterials. So... Uh just a second. I can I can translate what uh, David just said. Uh, he said that uh, nanomaterials uh, nowadays. Я сейчас переведу, что сказал Дэвид. Он сказал, что наноматериалы в наше время можно найти практически в очень многих вещах, как в потребительских товарах, так и в каких-то более 
высоких технологиях, которые используются для производства различных материалов и продукции. И сейчас мы можем опять продолжить презентацию. Минуточку. Thank you very much, uh, Lydia. So now I can tell you about what it is that we do and what it is that others and what you can do uh, to engage in this topic. Although it seems like a very technical and very complex topic, uh, there is actually a lot that can be done already and a lot of ways to engage in these particular issues. So next slide, please. So I'll, I'll, I'll start now already while I wait for the presentations to come back up. So as was mentioned by Lydia uh, earlier, I work for the uh, Center for International Environmental Law. There's a picture of us from sometimes and a picture of me when I was much younger and I had much more hair. Um, Ciel has been established in 1989. And since then, we have worked to strengthen and use international law and institutions to protect the environment, promote human health, and ensure a just and sustainable society. Uh, we believe that humans are part of the environment and that uh, we should put in place a number of international rules to better um, regulate our relationship with the rest of nature and the rest of the environment. And we have been working on nano issues now as part of our environmental health program uh, since 2008, uh, so for almost 10 years. Uh, next slide, please. As was mentioned also by Lydia at the beginning, uh, we are also part of a much wider network that is called IPEN for International Pops Elimination Network, which is a network of several hundreds of NGOs in uh, 150 countries working for a toxic-free future. Uh, this network, you can see a picture of some of us uh, here, it was established in 1998, and it's now really the main civil society voice in chemical-related international processes. Ciel has been leading the work of IPEN on nanomaterials uh, since IPEN started to work on nano in 2009, and we have a dedicated working group with approximately 60 members in uh, 35 countries. Uh, next slide, please. And so the overall objective of both Ciel and all the organization we work with in the IPEN Nano Working Group is to support the adoption of a global precautionary framework for the governance of nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. Uh, because a lot of the international discussions are sometimes slow, we also work uh, on the ground with various organizations to support the development of national or regional legal framework. So we do that by uh, creating the space uh, for uh, the, the space for international discussions on the topic and to influence those uh, discussions. Uh, next slide, please. And so we have a three-pronged strategy. The first one is to create space uh, for those global discussions to happen and try to influence those discussions. So we do this in the context of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or in the context of the strategic approach for international chemical management, for example, this is the picture that you're seeing here, 
or uh, in the context of the various international conventions, such as the Basel Conventions, who adopted a resolution last year uh, to look at the role of the conventions for nano wastes. What we also do, another part of our strategy, because obviously we cannot do this alone, is to work to raise awareness and build capacity for all other actors. So that means other NGOs, civil society, media, uh, and regulators in developing countries. Because uh, very often, although there is little production of nanomaterials in developing countries, it depends on the region, but uh, there's usually a little less. Uh, because of international trade, every country will have to deal with nanomaterials at some point or others of the life cycle. And the last piece of our strategy is to uh, develop the development of a strong precautionary framework in a champion region. And we chose the EU because the EU has historically uh, been the region that looked at this uh, topic in more detail and who showed more willingness to move forward. And in effect, there are a number of regulations in the EU about an obligation to label nanomaterials in cosmetics and food. Um, so Lydia, this is not in the presentation, maybe you can uh, uh, translate this, but there is legislation about specific testing of nanomaterials, again, in cosmetics and food. There are regulation about, uh, specific regulation about labeling, and we're now working for a modification of the general chemical legislation reach uh, to take into account uh, nanomaterials and nanotechnologies. And we do this because we think that once the EU has put in place this legal framework, it will help us uh, create a level playing field for the rest of the world and also uh, protect uh, citizens and human beings and nature uh, all around the world. Yes, I would like to translate what uh, David он сказал о том, что сейчас много делается для того, чтобы привести в норму состояние наноматериалов, то есть идет, помещаются лейблы на наноматериалы, идет тестирование различных наноматериалов, и, в общем-то, разрабатываются какие-то законодательные рамки для того, чтобы наноматериалы были приведены в, общем, в соответствие с законодательством и э, с, со всем остальным. are what is the role of uh, civil society and how have NGOs tried to influence this process? Uh, the first NGOs that looked at this question were really considered pioneers because it was in, in the 1990s before any nanomaterials started being uh, produced massively. We're just starting to understand the process. And this was a group called Etc. Group that is uh, based in Canada, and they're, they're, they were really the pioneers. After that, early in uh, 2007, there was an initiative from various NGOs, uh, including the International Center for Technology Assessment and Friends of the Earth, uh, to put in place principles for the oversights of nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. It has currently been signed by over 80 groups, I think now, on all continents. And those groups include environmental NGOs, uh, workers organization, research organizations, um, and, and others. Um, next slide, please. There is another network that I want to mention now, which is the Network of Friends of the Earth. 
so Friends of the Earth is a large international NGO network. It includes members in almost all around the planet. And they have also been uh, working on this issue for some time. Uh, it, their work is being led by uh, Friends of the Earth US, Friends of the Earth Australia, and Friends of the Earth Germany, Bund. And they do a lot of uh, public awareness and campaigning. Uh, they do consumer guides. They do newsletters, uh, position paper, product testing. And they have been doing this in the early days of the campaign until maybe 2012, 2013, or 14. But now it uh, they have a little more troubles to continue in supporting this work. But they continue to do uh, some of those. And I will tell you about the, the, the newer strategies that are being put in place by different actors uh, right now. So next slide, please. Uh, now, a few words about the IPEN Nano Working Group. So, as I mentioned earlier, IPEN is a very large network, and we have created a Nano Working Group. And uh, there are a lot of very various and heterogeneous organizations, uh, from farmers' organizations uh, in Asia or Africa, to specific organizations that work with researchers, uh, to advocacy or capacity building organizations. This group tried to provide a single unified voice for civil society in international negotiations. We have a focus on developing countries and in collaboration with other network. So there is, you recognize the network Friends of the Earth. There is also a network called Relance, which is a network of academics in um, Latin America that we work quite a bit with. And we are open uh, for uh, contribution, for collaboration with a lot of the, with any group that is willing uh, to work on this topic. We do some awareness raising and capacity building activities. Uh, through the organization of uh, regional or national workshops, webinars such as the one that we are holding now, regional booklets. So we currently don't have a specific booklet uh, for the um, Eastern Europe and Central Asian region, but we have one on the social and environmental implication of nanotechnology development with a focus on Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, and uh, Africa. A lot of this, these booklets are available on the IPEN website, and a lot of the information is relevant also for all regions. Um, and we also publish position papers uh, for negotiation and participate uh, in the various uh, negotiations. Uh, next slide, please. In the past few years, there have also been a flurry of new dynamics and new initiatives that are being put in place. So there was a collaborative project between three organizations, CL, my organization, ECOS, an EU-based standardization organization, and the ECO Institute, which is a research institution. And here the idea was to try to increase cooperation between different stakeholders and in particular between hard scientists and social scientists and campaigners and policymaker. And so the idea was uh, to cooperate with a lot of uh, other stakeholders, to serve on the broader community and uh, to focus objective uh, as part of a larger strategy. So, in the context of this project, we have developed a number of fact sheets on definition, on toxicity, on the role of the OECD, this organization that plays a great role. Uh, we have also published a declaration on wastes that contain nanomaterial. It is not shown here uh, on this slide, but it is available on CL website. And you can find, uh, you can still sign on to it and, uh, and still support the, this declaration on how to deal with waste that contain nanomaterials. 
It is currently signed by 120 organizations and individuals and research institutions uh, around the world. There are also, uh, the next slide, uh, please. There are also a number of uh, other organizations in the US and the EU who are developing also alternative strategies, including uh, putting the pressure, market pressure on the producers uh, through testing of food or testing of baby milk, for example. So in the past couple of years, uh, some organizations have tested baby milk uh, product and identified some uh, unauthorized nanomaterials, possibly dangerous nanomaterials in there. They also identified uh, nanomaterials in a lot of food products from donuts glazing to uh, chocolate bars and others. And by raising the public's attention to the activities of those uh, uh, of those actors, of those producers, those campaigns have managed to get commitments from very large corporate corporation to stop using uh, a number of nanomaterials in their products. Those test testings have also led to some legal actions, for example, in the EU, where there are labeling obligations that were not complied with and so the authorities uh, started doing some enforcement as a result of uh, activities by uh, NGOs. Now, um, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the topic of nanomaterial is sometimes a little complex and some organizations are not very confident in moving into this place, this space. Because this is a very broad topic, uh, the convergence of highly technical societal and policy issues. Uh, among the societal and policy issues, uh, there include questions of privacy, because uh, there, there you can create some very small um, sensors via nanotechnologies, there are issues of use of medicals, the use of nanomaterials uh, in medical application and others. Another challenge is uh, to be inclusive because of the diversity of uh, stakeholders, the regional diversity, because there is also a lot of different worldviews about the role of innovations or the role of technology. It is very important and a challenge for us to make sure that we include all of those different worldviews and all those different views when we build this, uh, the campaigns around this. Another challenge is the limited resources for, uh, and space for a constructive and critical point of view. Very often, and I'm sure a lot of the participants will be familiar with this, uh, authorities or developers or industries believe that technological innovation equals social progress. And we know it's not always the case. We know that you can have some very interesting technological innovation, but that doesn't really um, help society as a whole with this progress or the benefits from those innovations can be captured by some sectors of society. And it's also a challenge because of the multi-discipline that are required to think and act on this. You need hard science, uh, 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 nanoscience, you need toxicology, ecotoxicology. You need social science to understand how innovation will impact society and how would it will be incorporated by society. You need uh, to look at policy aspects or how do you balance the support for innovation and the consideration for health and environmental aspects. Legal issues, of course, uh, when you talk about what sorts of rules should be put in place and issues of development because uh, those new innovations are seen as a mean to, dev for, to development for a number of countries. And then comes the question of whether we are too late uh, and how much can we influence 
the development of this technology when it seems that a lot of the resources have already been committed to uh, develop this technology uh, at any costs, really. So uh, next slide, please. We have uh, various strategies to address those challenges. First of all, we identify strategic objectives uh, to move and to change the situation on the ground via testings, for example, and via putting pressure on corporate actors or policy actors. We also try to cultivate diversity of views, regional diversity, and not to turn away from challenges and to accept that this is a complex issue, that there is no simple answers to the questions we're raising here, uh, but we need to consider those heads on. We also try to be as inclusive as possible of all the different uh, uh, worldviews and regional uh, differences. We also allow for um, ad hoc initiatives and collaboration, like the one I mentioned, for example, on the between Ciel, Ecos, and Eco Institutes, or others uh, between organizations that are not part of the same network, but who work together uh, in the same directions. And like I said, we do uh, uh, a lot of coordination uh, of the work of various networks to ensure that because there are limited resources, we don't double up the work and we support each other in our various campaigns and various uh, endeavors and initiatives. So how do we do this? Uh, next slide, please. Is we try to create a virtuous circle. Uh, we start with raising awareness, like what we're doing through this webinar, for example, and build capacity of citizens to understand the issue and to be able to look into the issue. When we do this, we've noticed that it increases the engagement of citizens and organizations because if they understand the topic better, they can, uh, they can better engage. And while they do this, while more group engage, it allows us to have a more global perspective and to be more inclusive of the different issues because um, the issues that are facing uh, Japan are different from what is happening uh, in Europe, is different from what the strategies that are being developed in Kazakhstan or in Belarus or in some African countries, for example. So by increasing the engagement, we increase the different perspective and the different e expertise. And by doing this, we provide more constructive results and more output. We get better results because we take into better consideration the reality and the complexity of the situation on the ground. By showing that we get better results, it allows us to increase the resources and then continue building awareness and capacity building in this sort of virtuous circle. So it doesn't always work as we want it to work. Of course, there are still some obstacles, but overall, over the years, we've managed to build a good network of NGOs and try to build this particular uh, circle. So um, next slide, please. There is a, a lot that you can do. I've mentioned a lot of uh, resources. You can find a lot of the fact sheets uh, at the address that is shown here at the uh, www.cl.org uh, and if you look for the issue nanotechnologies you will have access to all of the fact sheets uh, none of them are translated in russian at this point they're available in english french and some of them in spanish if you would like to translate them in russian they're completely open source and you're uh, most uh, invited to do this, to use them and put your logo on it. The only thing that you that we ask is that you keep the logo of the original organizations who have been doing the work. But other than that, you can use them, uh, translate them, uh, modify them or use them as you see fit in your own campaign and in your own environment. Uh, 
You can also join the iPen Nano Working Group, and that is uh, the simplest way to do this is to send me an email. You'll see that my email is on the last slide of this presentation. Send me an email by mentioning that you have listened to the webinar and you would like to join initiatives of other NGOs around the world to get more information and know how to get involved. And you can connect with regional experts and organizations, such as Green Woman, for example, who is uh, organizing uh, this webinar, or other organizations that you may be aware of or familiar with. So final slides. Uh, Thank you very much for your attention. Here is my uh, email uh, address. Feel free to send me emails if you'd like uh, some further information or if you would like to be associated with some of the work that we're doing at the global or regional level. And I am now uh, uh, waiting for all of your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and uh, we have a few questions uh, from our participants. Uh, first question from Natalia Abdulaeva uh, from NGO Uzbekistan, Environmental NGO Uzbekistan. You mentioned that the strategy includes to create the space for and influence global discussions, uh, OAS OASD, SAICM in the field of nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. Our countries participate in OS, OESD and SAICM processes. However, we don't have much knowledge about nano. For example, about nanotechnology-based consumer products databases of good, uh, goods containing nano. Do they exist such databases? Uh, probably, first of all, we need to have an idea about nanotechnology-based consumer products that we use in everyday life uh, so that we can apply a precautionary principles to them. Uh, my question is the following. Do you think that some donor international organizations could provide the grants for programs or offer as opportunities to raise awareness and build capacity for civil society organizations, media and regulatory bodies in developing countries regarding nano. IPEN Network could conduct a number of specific projects in Russian-speaking countries to raise awareness regarding nano, as IPEN does during the International Lead Poisoning and Prevention Week of Action. Uh, this is just as an example. So, thank you very much for the question. On the first question, uh, are there lists, official lists of products that contain nanomaterials? There is no official list. There are a number of uh, inventories that exist, but they are necessarily incomplete because uh, there is no obligation to declare the use of nano, and it's uh, testing products for nano is sometimes complex. So it's mostly based on uh, information that is derived from declaration from the producers or other information that we understand about this. So there is a uh, Bund, I think the German Friends of the Earth has made a list. The, the, there was one original list uh, in the US that was made by the Pew Charitable Trust. I know that the Danish uh, consumer organization have also made a list. We have been fighting for a long time with the EU institutions to get uh, some sort of a list, but uh, so far we have not been successful. They have an observatory. So unfortunately, there is not, not all information can be located in one space. But there are a lot of different spaces where you can find information uh, uh, about those nanos, and I'm happy to uh, share via emails with some of you afterward where you can find some in some of those information. As to the question of are there international donors willing to do this, the answer is yes to a certain extent, in that there are international projects uh, that are funded by UNITAR or by Switzerland, I know that we might also be able to raise some small seed funding for awareness-raising activities 
in the countries via networks like IPEN and others. Uh, so yes, it's it's difficult. It's uh, it's it's not the easiest subject to raise money for, but we believe that there could be some uh, limited amount of resources available for those uh, activities. What is needed is to develop a real plan on what sort of activities we would like to put in place and then we could approach some uh, international uh, donors uh, or networks uh, to support these activities. Uh, just a second, David, I will uh, interpret now. Thank you. Sorry if that was too long of an answer. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, uh, David сказал, что uh, как таковой э, вот этот вот лист наноматериалов, он в принципе еще не полный, потому что нет никаких обязательств uh, у производителей сообщать о наноматериалах, используемых наноматериалах. В принципе, какой-то лист был подготовлен немецкой организацией «Друзья Земли». В принципе, они что-то сделали, но пока еще идет работа, и нужно продолжать этот лист заполнять, поскольку, как уже было сказано, нет никаких обязательств у продюсеров, у производителей сообщать о материалах, но, тем не менее, работа в этом направлении ведется. Что касается, что касается грантов от международных организаций, от доноров на повышение осведомленности в сфере нанотехнологий, то в принципе, да, сказал Дэвид, есть возможности получить такие гранты, например, от Юнитар или шведской организации по оказанию помощи. Но для начала, конечно, нужно разработать какой-то план, уже с которым организации могли бы выйти на доноров и уже сообщить о том, что они могли бы предложить сделать в этом плане. Спасибо. Thank you. У нас есть второй вопрос от журналиста, эксперта по экологическим темам Зои Корнеева из Казахстана. Usually strong public organizations and networks deal with such complex issue as nanotechnology. Usually strong public organizations and networks. We know that Uh, Green Women in October 2017 prepared a report entitled Nanotechnology for Environment and Medicine, a very detailed report actually describing the development of nanotechnologies in Central Asia and some other uh, countries. Uh, does there a popularized uh, guide exist on aspects of nanotechnology that made specifically for NGOs? Uh, perhaps it... Uh, Now, perhaps it would be a good idea to develop or translate to Russian such guide for organization in, ye, uh, in Eastern Europe, Central uh, Asia and Cauc Caucasus region. A guide containing section on legislation, international instruments on nano and uh, so forth. Uh, thanks very much for the question. This is, this is a very good point and you're right. Um, so the good news is there is these kinds of a guide about nano made for NGOs, by NGOs and for NGOs, some of those exist. And there is already, I mentioned earlier in my presentation that IPEN had prepared some booklets. So in each of the regional booklets, you have uh, general information about what is nanomaterials, the legislation, the impact on innovation, the impact on, on jobs, the impact on health, uh, the environment, etc. And then for each of the guide, we try to include a specific uh, section on uh, the regional development. Uh, unfortunately, these were not uh, translated to Russians. We had an attempt some times ago, and unfortunately, it, it didn't go through, but maybe we could combine 
uh, some of the aspects, the translation of some aspects of these guides with the document that was prepared by Green Woman already in Russian in 2017 and combine those two uh, in a tool that could be useful for all of the NGOs. So if there is interest by organizations in the region uh, to develop something like this, I think it would be possible to put together relatively simply and uh, maybe we could ask Green Woman organization to be the link between all the different participants and the IPEN working group and then we can discuss together how best to make this happen. Я сейчас перейду, что сказал Дэвид. Он сказал о том, что, в принципе, IPEN подготовил очень много различных материалов, таких вот гидов, о которых спрашивала наша, наша, спрашивала наша участница, то есть содержащих законодательные аспекты и прочие аспекты нанотехнологий. И, в принципе, конечно, к сожалению, сказал Дэвид, мы не перевели, не смогли перевести, вернее, ну, не было возможности перевести это на русский язык, но возможно сейчас такая, такая возможность и предоставится, потому что мы можем объединить, сделать попытку объединения то, того, что написал, что создал Green Women, отчет и э, объединить э, то, что как, материалы, имеющиеся у IPEN, и создать вот такой вот э, гид, о котором вы говорите, э, участники, э, который будет полезен для региональных организаций. Возможно, Green Women, э, Green Women может выступить э, таким соединяющим звеном между э, группой IPEN по нанотехнологиям и организациями. Спасибо большое. И сейчас я думаю, что Лидия также, она мне сообщила, что у нее есть вопрос от нашего участника. Пожалуйста, Лидия. Лана Ахмедова, предприниматель из Бишкека, больше интересуют технические вопросы, касающиеся нано. Есть ли банк данных по нанотехнологиям и наноматериалам или создается, можно ли получить к нему доступ? А также, например, банк данных по тестированию продукции, содержащей нано. Какой вопрос? Спасибо, Лидия. Нурлан Ахмедов, бизнесмен из Киргизстана, он спрашивает... I'm more interested in technical issues related to nano. Um, does a database on nanotechnology and nanomaterials exist or is it in a process of development? Uh, is it possible for businesses to have access to such database? And also, for example, uh, does a database containing the results of nanotechnology-based consumer products exist? And uh, is it possible to have access to it? Uh, I, I guess it's he's asking as a businessman for businesses, or maybe possibly even for uh, ordinary citizens. Thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, there is no centralized database that identifies all nanomaterials being produced or all products that contains nanomaterial. Uh, this information is a little scattered in different places. But there are uh, a number of uh, places where you can gain information. There are uh, some scientific journals that are specifically dedicated to nanomaterials. <clears throat> there are a number of inventories. The EU has also started a, a nano observatory uh, that is available online where they publish a lot of information. So that might be a good base uh, for a businessman looking for more information about this. Uh, that could be a good place to start, the EU Nano uh, Observatory. Uh, another, uh, and it depends what is the specific interest of that person, but it is also sometimes worth getting in touch 
with the scientific department of each of the countries because as far as I know, all of the countries, including in the Eastern and Cent uh, in the Central Europe and Central Asia region, have developed uh, centers for the development of nanotechnologies. And so it might be valuable or interesting to also get in touch with the National Center for Nanotechnology to get more information about the local uh, source of development. But overall, I would say the Nano EU Observatory is a good place to start. The inventories of nano products that I mentioned earlier, in particular the one from the Danish um, uh, Consumer Council, these would be two good places to start. And there are also a number of uh, newsletters and websites that uh, provide a lot of information on nanomaterials. Maybe I can uh, write some of them in the chat box and you can circulate them to the, uh, to the various participants who are interested. Спасибо, Дэвид. И сейчас я переведу то, что сказал Дэвид. Как я сказал, сообщил Дэвид, здесь нет как таковой вот базы по нанотехнологиям и наноматериалам, потому что информация распределена, она распределена по различным источникам. Однако, тем не менее, ее можно собрать, например, из каких-то научных источников, из инвентарных материалов. Первое место, которое я хотел бы порекомендовать, источник, от, откуда вы можете почерпнуть много информации, это нано-обсерватория Европейского Союза. Здесь очень много различной информации для использования, для практического использования как для бизнесменов, так и для рядовых граждан. Другой специфический источник, который также можно порекомендовать, это, например, инвентарные инвентарные источники датского совета потребителей, которые тоже подготовили вот так, такого рода информацию, из которой вот можно узнать о наноматериалах и нанотехнологиях. Я также порекомендовал бы обратиться к, в центры, в вашей стране, в центры по развитию нанотехнологий. Я знаю, что во многих странах, в том числе в странах Центральной Азии, существуют подобные центры по развитию нанотехнологий, к которым вы тоже можете обратиться и задать интересующий вас вопрос. Но повторюсь, вот самые, значит, вот самые два таких центральных источника – это нано-обсерватория Европейского Союза и инвентарные материалы Датского совета потребителей. Спасибо. Я думаю, что... Лидия, есть у нас вопросы еще? Да, сейчас вопросов нет. Ну, я хотела бы поблагодарить от имени всех участников Дэвида, несмотря на его занятость, он нашел время, чтобы провести этот интересный семинар, семинар для нас. Также я хотела бы извиниться за некоторые технические проблемы, которые у нас здесь произошли с Бои во время вебинара. И, судя по вопросам, наши страны хотели бы активнее участвовать в работе. И, уважаемые участники, если у вас будут еще вопросы к нашему спикеру или к нам, пожалуйста, присылайте на нашу электронную почту или на почту, которую вам представил Дэвид, и мы вам ответим в самое ближайшее время. И большое вам всем спасибо. Спасибо, Лидия. Я сейчас хотела бы перевести то, что сказала Лидия. Thank you very much, David, for your participation thank you we know uh, that you are very busy and we uh, really appreciate that you found time for us and it's really interesting webinar <clears throat> thank you so much again and thank you for providing us uh, the sources of information and i also would like to to uh, to say thank you to all our participants and uh, uh, you can uh, and say that you can uh, send your questions to uh, our email e to email that David provided uh, if you have uh, any questions on nanotechnologies and nanomaterials. 
So thank you very much to Green Woman for organizing this. I think this is a, a, a really a fantastic initiative and I really want to thank you again and congratulate you again for giving me the opportunity to share some of that information with you. And uh, I very much look forward to increasing collaboration with, uh, with other organizations or individuals in the region. And uh, I very much look forward to hearing again from many of you. So thank you very much. Um, большое спасибо uh, всем, кто сегодня участвовал. Большое спасибо Green Women за организацию этого вебинара. И я надеюсь, что uh, наше, наше сотрудничество будет продолжено. Uh, пожалуйста, пишите и задавайте свои вопросы. И мы, я с нетерпением ожидаю другой возможности, uh, чтобы по, пообщаться с участниками и uh, ответить на вопросы. Thank you so, uh, thank you so much, and uh, we apologize for uh, some technical problems during the webinar. Uh, I hope it didn't uh, interrupt too much. I think it was great. Thank you very mm -hmm. much, Lydia and Lydia.